Fabulous. Thanks, Rod. Um, as Rod has said, my talk tonight will be on heads of claim, slight to moderate injuries. I'll try and keep it as interesting as I can. It's more interesting than some of the other ones. Um, but if you do feel at any time as though you want to go out on your motorcycle, I will not be offended. It's a lovely night. Um, now, I suppose I should start, for those of you who perhaps are new or haven't attended one of these webinars before about I should maybe discuss a little bit about us as a firm. So we are Motorcycle Law Scotland. We are a specialist personal injury firm. We deal exclusively with motorcycle incidents. That's a few of members of staff there. Um, effectively, what our residentra is, is to provide as most utmost specialist and personal service to motorcyclists. And really, we're by motorcyclists for motorcyclists. So yes, we're solicitors, but a lot of us are also motorcyclists. And following a crash, it's really important to seek as best legal advice as you possibly can. And preferably, you're wanting to seek advice from an expert in motorcycle accident claims. And that's effectively where we come in. A lot of the time, you might be passed to what's known as a panel solicitor by your insurance company when you ring them up, having been involved in an accident. And these panel sisters can do a job, you know, they're there, their job that they do is okay, but at the end of the day, they're buying in your case from your insurer and their fees are not going to be as maximized as they possibly can. So they spend as little time as possible on your case. So instructing independent and objective legal advice is always quite important. And that's what we specialize in. Um, you can see up there in the photo, we're all standing uh, with Brenda's Yamaha MT9, which coincidentally she rode into the office and back today because it was such a lovely day. Um, and it's just, it's, it's great to be part of such a wonderful team that not only, you know, are motorcyclists, but we also care deeply about our clients. Um, I suppose also for those of you that don't know me um, or have not been part of the webinars before, you might have seen me with a rather uh, different haircut. I had a long, large mop of blonde hair on top of my head, but I have now been able to get to the hairdresser, which is good. So feeling a lot better and lighter. Um, a bit about me as a, a solicitor, I suppose. I did my training up in Aberdeen initially, and then I came back to Edinburgh, completed my legal training there, and I was offered a traineeship with Motorcycle Law Scotland. So to become a lawyer, you're five years of university study and then two years of on-the-job training. So we're trained like doctors. You wouldn't want anybody going near your personal injury claim, so that's how we're trained. And I've done all of my training exclusively with Motorcycle Law Scotland, and I have been a qualified solicitor for just coming up for two years here. Um, a bit about what I, you know, my motorcycle experience. Um, I passed my motorcycle test, I think it was 2008 summer it might have been 2019 one of the two I'd always ridden motorcycles since I was a boy and um, fortunate enough to have um, a little motocross bike when I was younger I used to drive all the neighbors mad by riding that around the garden um, I have recently acquired that's me in the photo on the right a 1998 beta trials bike so on the weekends I enjoy falling off of that um, but that's a bit of my motorcycle experience um, in terms of the firm, we cover the length and breadth of Scotland. So the main difference between us and perhaps your run of the mill personal injury solicitors is before COVID times, we would probably come to your house and visit you. Um, if you'd been involved in a particularly you know, catastrophic incident or something where your injury was on the serious side, then we'd likely come and see you at your home, discuss your case with you and provide that personal service. We're not solicitors living in ivory towers. We're very much people just like you. And we believe offering a personal level of care and service is what's most important. And that's why we offer the length and breadth service. Now, before we talk about heads of claim generally, we should really set um, the background, the legal framework within which all of this operates. And if you think of the law as a tree, there are two separate distinct branches to that tree. One of them is the criminal law and one of them is the civil law. Your personal injury claim runs under the civil law. 
So it has nothing to do with anything criminal. Um, you can see up there on the slide, you have Rumpel of the ba Old Bailey, who um, is a fictitious character, although suspiciously like a lot of people who exist in real life. And you also have Martha Costello, who played um, an advocate or barrister in the BBC drama Silk. Now, the two major differences between civil and criminal law are firstly, the parties involved, and secondly, the burden of proof. As far as the parties involved are concerned, with criminal law, you're looking at um, the state versus an accused person. So ordinarily, if you ever read any case reports in the papers, it will be HMA, Her Majesty's Advocate, or the PF of a particular location versus an accused person. So the relationship is between that of the state and an accused. Whereas in the civil law, that's concerned with private um, transactions or private things occurring between individuals. So duties of care being owed and perhaps breached, but ultimately it's about, you know, it's a private law, civil law. Um, for example, you can have situations where both the criminal law and the civil law are operating together as part of one um, incident. So say, for example, there is a motorcycle incident that occurs where the motorcyclist had been speeding and a car pulled out of a junction in front of them. Now, what might happen is the motorcyclist may very well be charged with careless driving for the speed element involved, or there may even be a charge for the driver pulling out and not seeing them being involved. But also there'll be a civil claim resulting out of that same incident. Now, just because there is a criminal matter, it doesn't necessarily preclude the civil claim from carrying on. They are two separate and distinct branches of the law. The other difference, as I mentioned, is the evidential burden. So whenever a criminal case is brought, the Crown or the person bringing the case um, must prove an action beyond reasonable doubt. So they must prove a person did something beyond a reasonable doubt. If there's any flicker of doubt in the mind of a jury or a sheriff, then the answer is that the person who's accused of the particular crime must be acquitted. Or in Scotland, there is a unique not proven verdict. So we're one of the only legal jurisdictions which has three possible verdicts. Whereas in the civil law, you have a much lower evidential burden. You, as the person bringing the claim, have to only prove on balance of probabilities something happened. So is something more likely than not? Is it more likely than not that the actions of this driver who pulled out in front of me caused the collision as opposed to my speed, for example? So it's really a 50-50 benchmark if something's 51 percent more likely to have happened than not then really your civil claim can proceed so it's not quite as difficult to prove a civil case as it is a criminal case now there are a number of things to consider before bringing any court case and before we get going this is basically the rules where solicitors and insurers have to do certain things before we go anywhere near the doors of a court now those rutting stags represent an insurer and a solicitor and i can assure you that our system is quite adversarial but it's good that it's adversarial because at the end of the day we are concerned with doing the best we possibly can for the client and they as the insurer are concerned with saving money now, sometimes adversarial systems don't work as well as they could, but at all times, the person put at the center of the action is quite rightly the person who's been injured. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, the pre-action protocol, or to give it its full name, the Act of Sudorant, open brackets, Sheriff Court Rules Amendment, close brackets, open brackets, personal injury, pre-action protocol, close brackets, 2016. Ooh are effectively the rules, as I say, between insurers and solicitors before any court action can be raised. So if you come to us having been involved in a motorcycle incident, this is how your case will initially proceed. It won't go near a court. It will be negotiated with the insurer, first of all, the insurer of the at-fault party. Now, under the protocol, certain things have to be done by certain time and date. So an insurer has 21 days initially to note interest to say, yes, hello, we are the insurer of this vehicle or driver who you say is negligent. 
And thereafter, there is a liability decision that has to be taken within 12 weeks of the claim initially being intimated. So it's not a huge window. In this 12 weeks, what will normally happen is the insurer will speak to their policyholder as to what happened and then gather any other relevant evidence. I've yet to encounter an insurer that did anything other than just speak to a policyholder. It's normally us that can gather the liability evidence. Um, you'll be in gathering things from Police Scotland, witness testimony, all sorts of different things to deal with the liability aspect of the claim. But really, you're concerned with two things in any civil case. And that is the question of, firstly, liability, and secondly, the question of quantum. Now, liability is who's at fault. You see that on the left, his fault, her fault, their fault, not me. A lot of the time, if you're involved in an incident, you might have a driver of, say, a negligent, uh, sorry, you might have a driver who says, oh, I'm terribly sorry, didn't see you there, my fault. And then suddenly when you come to us and the claim is intimated, that driver's story has changed and liability might be denied for a number of reasons. So your claim is always principally concerned with trying to deal with the issue of who's at fault. Sometimes it's obvious who's at fault and other times it's a little bit more nuanced. Ultimately, what it comes down to is the individual facts in each and every case. And it's very important to gather evidence quickly, carefully, and as much evidence as you possibly can. The second strand of your claim is quantum, i.e. the valuation of your claim. And my talk tonight is really about how do you come to a valuation decision? How do you put a monetary figure on what's happened to you if you've been injured as a result of a motorcycle incident? And really, it's more of an art than it is a science valuing a claim. And it's a bit of a dark art, and lawyers are very well versed in the dark arts. Um, a lot of the time, when you're valuing a claim, you're not valuing it on the basis of what you think. You are taking into consideration evidence from other sources. And these are the four main sources which I would normally consider. It's not an exhaustive list, but these are the four kind of main ones. So what you're looking at is expert evidence, documentary evidence, your own client's testimony, and any witness testimony. Each of these can sometimes point you in different directions as to gather more information or give you a definitive answer about certain aspects of a claim. But all evidence is in gathered and prepared as though it would be put before a court. That's effectively how your claim is built by a solicitor or a good one at the very least. Lawyers don't make up the evidence. It's ultimately our job to in gather, analyze, advise and then take instruction from you the client on what the evidence says we have a duty to you as a client to advise you independently but also we have a duty to the court so everything is done with a fierce independent objective and these are the main sources where evaluation may come from so the initial start point for valuing a claim and this applies mainly to the injury aspect of your claim is this little book and i'm sure i have a copy on my desk somewhere here we go now you can see up on the slide this is the judicial college sounds very grandiose guidelines for the assessment of general damages in personal injury cases now these books are produced annually i think and this is the 14th edition so maybe not annually but they're updated every now and then, and ultimately what they are is they're an amalgamation of case law. And within these books, there are brackets um, for certain injuries, believe it or not. And it's a little bit of a strange concept if you're not used to valuing claims, because you can think, how can somebody possibly put a figure on my pain and suffering? How can you do that? And it's a strange concept when you think about it compensation because compensation ultimately is a recognition that something has happened to you you've been wronged in some way and there needs to be an effort to put that right now despite the headlines you might see of people being awarded millions for this and damages and millions for that and there's a compensation culture that does not exist. There is no such thing as a compensation culture. And this is one of my things I bang my drum about an awful lot. If you ever ask a client, would you rather have received compensation or would you rather this incident had never occurred? The answer is always that the incident had never occurred. 
Compensation isn't about winning a prize. It's not about being awarded money. It's literally about giving you a compensatory award to recognize that a wrong has happened to you. And there's a desire to put it right. But as I say, it is a science, it is an art and not a science. Um, we'll pick one at random, for example. This might be a little strange, but for example, we can look at, say, injuries to an elbow. Um, and if you look at, it's done in various um, categories of injury. So at random, an injury to an elbow, under B, a less severe injury, which the book defines as injuries causing impairment or function, but not involving major surgery or significant disability, you may be awarded a figure of between 13,720 and 28,060 pounds. So it gives you quite a broad range. Um, it's not an exact, as I say, science. It's really about looking at the evidence in a particular case, your client as the individual that they are, any medical evidence that can assist you. It's really, this is a starting point with an evaluation. It just get, gets you in the ballpark. Beyond that, what you're using is case law. Um, a lot of the times you'll have cases that have previously been heard in court where the injury sustained by the person who brought the case is very similar to that of your client. Now, it's not a definitive answer to say, well, because this person was awarded X for a fracture to their wrist, it means that your client should be awarded the same amount. It does come down to the individual circumstances because everybody is an individual. But it also gives you a bit of a guideline as to what a court might award your client when looking at previous case law as well. So that's ultimately where advice comes in relation to valuation. It's really what would a court award you? What would a sheriff award you? Or what would a jury award you? Um, and that's really our start point. But there are other heads of claim as well. Um, salatium itself, which is the pain and suffering, falls generally into two brackets. Um, you have the physical injury, but also the psychological injury. And this has been a big development in the law, which has come along a lot since um, the kind of early 1960s, 70s. Nowadays, we are much more attuned to psychological difficulties people may suffer as a result of road traffic accidents and mental health difficulties in general. There's been a big shift in society about recognizing that mental health is just as important, if not more important than sometimes physical health. And Whenever you're involved in a road traffic accident, it's quite a significant thing to go through. For some people, it may be the very first time that they've questioned their own mortality. And getting over that can sometimes be quite difficult. So the court is attuned to this and we're aware of it. And there is a recognition that if psychological injury has been sustained, then that needs to be reflected in any award of compensation. And likewise, just as you'd have expert evidence for a physical injury, you're able to gather expert medical evidence for a psychological one too. Other heads of claim um, which are quite common are financial losses. So you have your loss of earnings. You may have been off work as a result of the incident. Any additional treatment costs which have been incurred, for example, if you had private physiotherapy or um, cognitive behavioral therapy or anything which has been incurred as a result of the accident. Um, additional travel expenses, particularly in some of the more meaty, moderate cases, you might have several trips back and forth to um, the orthopedic outpatient department at the hospital that's treating you. If you're not driving, those travel expenses can mount up. Services is another um, head of claim, which we'll come on to in more detail in due course. Your all important motorcycle, that's included, obviously, as part of your claim and your motorcycle clothing and helmet. This list is not exhaustive by any way um, and by any stretch of the imagination. It's really just a broad overview that is what we're looking at. It always, as I've said, and I'll say it again, it comes down to the individual facts and circumstances in the case. So the first case study I thought I would identify talks a bit about this salation, so the pain and suffering aspect. So I've mentioned a little bit about how pain and suffering is assessed, but how does a lawyer actually put a monetary figure on you as the client? How do we get to that figure or bracket of figures that's appropriate? Where do we go? 
And normally where we would go is we would seek an expert report from somebody who's qualified to provide one. Now it can vary from injury to injury. Obviously the injury you sustain is going to inform what kind of expert report one needs. So for example, if you've suffered predominantly soft tissue injuries, then the most appropriate expert may be a consultant in accident emergency medicine. If you've suffered a fracture of some kind, it may be an orthopedic surgeon. If there are difficulties in relation to psychological um, problems, then we might need a consultant psychologist. It really does depend on the individual circumstances in the case. But your start point is looking at what has my client suffered and how are we best to address this? Now, the job of an independent medical expert is to firstly look at all of the treatment which has been done by whoever the treating team is. Normally, it's the NHS, unless there's private medical cover in place, but nine times out of 10, it's the NHS. So they'll have access to your medical records. And they'll also have a consultation with you as a client, and they'll thereafter produce a report, which you'll go through with a solicitor, and that informs ultimately what your claim is valued at in terms of the pain and suffering, because the expert will create both advice on treatment, how the incident occurred, and what's linked to the incident happening. Causation is what we call that. And they'll provide a prognosis. So any recommendations on treatment, that future costs that might be able to be included, all sorts of things. One particular thing which we tend to specialize in and I've not seen it done in many other firms is a lot of the time when you get knocked off your motorcycle it can really affect your confidence um, and sometimes it can manifest itself in even a, a fear of motorcycles so in order to try and help our clients sometimes we have had cases where we've had a, a report from a consultant psychologist that says this poor person has suffered, you know, a, a huge adjustment in relation to how they feel about a motorcycle. Previously, it was something which brought them great joy. And now they've had a huge loss of confidence and they just cannot bring themselves to get back on their bike. And there may be a recommendation for advanced motorcycle training or lessons. And we have in the past included claims for advanced motorcycle training. We tend to use a gentleman by the name of Roddy Benzes, who is a vastly experienced motorcyclist um, and advanced trainer. If you've ever seen the, the police motorcyclists, Roddy trains the police. So you can imagine the level of skill Roddy has. And we have had some great success stories in the past of people who have really had their confidence knocked, but a few sessions with Roddy, which they're able to access through their um, claim by having it included has really brought a huge turnaround in what could have been something which manifested itself as a much more serious psychological difficulty. They're able to get back on the horse, so to speak. Um, medical experts are brilliant because not only do they help us as lawyers understand the nature of the pain and suffering sustained by a client, but sometimes they can even help with liability. And the picture from the case study above is a case of mine, which I had, whereby you can see just to the right of the photo in front of that white Astra, there is a gap in the um, road. And that gap leads to a side street, which you can access. So my client was coming along the furthest right-hand lane heading towards the direction where the bin lorry is going. And the third party vehicle was waiting here on the left in this um, parking bay. And what happened was the third party vehicle pulled out initially into the first lane, which you can see, but thereafter performed a U-turn to go through that gap in the divided bit of the carriageway. And this all happened directly in front of my client who was just minding his own business. And he had to take evasive action to avoid hitting this vehicle. He managed to do that all but for his left foot, which struck the front bumper of this vehicle. And there was damage to the vehicle, um, which was supportive of this impact point. There was damage to his motorcycle in the form of a bent foot, foot peg. And there was also the obvious injury to his left foot, which was a bruise across the top of it. Now, interestingly, in this case, there was an allegation. Um, it had to be raised in court. And there was an allegation from the solicitors representing the driver of the vehicle, which performed the U-turn to say that our client had kicked this vehicle. 
And I don't know about you, but whenever I'm on a motorcycle, I don't think it's very wise to kick anything bigger than me. Um, and the case really hinged on whether or not our client had kicked this vehicle. The driver of the third party vehicle had two witnesses in the car, both of whom were related to them, who also said the client had kicked the vehicle. Now, without giving too much away about the client, he was um, himself a qualified doctor. By all accounts, he was an upstanding member of society, had never had any difficulty with anybody at all in his life, and just rode his motorcycle by way of commuting. And he was really concerned about this allegation of kicking because it might have had a possible effect on the way he was viewed by the medical board, because you have to be a fit and proper person in order to be a doctor. He was really concerned about this. But thankfully, we were able to seek an opinion from, in this case, it was a consultant in accident and emergency medicine, who was able to advise that the allegation in relation to kicking was utter nonsense. And the reason for that was firstly, the damage to the vehicle was not consistent with a kick. It was more consistent to a strike. And secondly, the pattern of injury across his foot did not support an allegation that it was a kick. It supported a crushing injury between the engine casing of the vehicle and the engine casing of the motorcycle and the vehicle which did the U-turn. So even though expert evidence is primarily to help you value a case, sometimes you can also use it to help with liability. And once we had that evidence in, the defender's case swiftly fell apart and settlement shortly followed. So it just shows you the importance of using these experts. And we always use the um, experts that are regularly instructed and are independent we don't have a panel that we use like some solicitors. We don't have a standard pro forma letter or pro forma report. These reports are all individual and tailored to you as the client. And that's what's most important. They're more expensive, but it doesn't matter because the most important thing is making sure the evidence is all accounted for. Now, moving on to financial losses. Normally, this will take the form of wage loss, but again, it really covers any financial loss sustained to you as a result of the accident. So it can cover all number of things, but normally it tends to manifest itself mostly as wage loss. Now, with employed individuals, it can be quite easy to assess wage loss because you, you get a pay packet every month or week or depending on how you're paid, and you'll have a period of absence as a result of the accident. So it's really a case of in gathering in evidence from your employer, and then you can see what you were paid before the accident, what you were paid during your absence, if anything, and then you can look at the loss and compare before and after, and then that's how you get to your figure of wage loss. With self-employed individuals, it can be a little bit more tricky. And again, this is where us lawyers rely on expert evidence if it's needed. A court would normally expect to look at three years of accountancy records for a self-employed individual in order to help assess their loss. A lot of the time, losses can sometimes be a little bit speculative in nature because you might have, for example, say if you are a self-employed consultant and you had a big contract lined up with a client, a new client, and it was all ready to go and you were due to start it on the Monday, and you were knocked off your bike on the Sunday, and you were in hospital, and you could not start that contract. The work all goes away. But your financial records may not reflect that, because there might be other things which have an effect on what your bottom line is year on year. So in that case, you're relying upon witness evidence um, and your own client's testimony about whether or not that work was available, and can that what might look initially like a speculative loss be included. So a lot of the time it comes down to making sure that you take good and detailed statements from your client and you understand all the aspects around the case. Um, sometimes as well in more complex cases, what you're looking at is you might need a report from a forensic accountant. Um, you may have done a wage loss calculation on the basis of records you've recovered from your client, which is fair enough, but I always see an insurer argue a wage loss point. It's common. And you would think it's not common, but it is. Um, there is always an argument in relation to wage loss. And I don't know why it is particularly, because you wouldn't think it's a very contentious issue, but it seems to be, particularly with self-employed individuals. 
Um, and ultimately, a report from a forensic accountant can sometimes be the difference between settling the case and not settling it. I did have one case recently where uh, the gentleman we were representing was an audiologist, and the injuries he had sustained basically meant that he couldn't stand on his feet for long periods of time. So he was able to keep working, but he had to reduce his client, um, the amount of clients he saw per day. And it had an impact on how much he was able to invoice. So he was a self-employed consultant, but he um, practiced out of a number of clinics, which he would invoice on a monthly basis. And there was a huge drop off in the amount he was able to invoice over the period that he wasn't able to fulfill a full list of clients. But it varied because obviously initially in the initial periods of his recovery, he was only able to see a few clients. But then as he got better, that number increased gradually until such time as he was back to his normal operating amount of clients. But in that particular case, we had to rely upon the report of a forensic accountant who took everything into consideration, including um, all of the previous invoicing he had made and his own testimony and came up with a figure um, that represented what the true loss was when you take into consideration all of the relevant taxation points and other things. A lawyer is simply not qualified to look at all of that. As I say, what we're qualified to do is look at the evidence and then advise on the evidence. But knowing where to get the evidence is sometimes quite an important thing. Other financial losses also obviously include, in the bigger cases, you might have something known as disadvantage in the open labor market. So if, say, your injury means that you can no longer do your job, if you're in your quite heavy manual handling job, and your injury basically means you can no longer lift things over your head, then it might have an effect on your ability to obtain work later on in future life. So that also needs to be considered. Things like pension loss as well, from pension loss reports, um, these are other things which are also included as part of your claim. Basically anything that's a financial loss connected directly to the incident can be potentially included as part of a claim. The next head of claim is services. Now, I appreciate I might be rambling on a little bit, um, but services are really, it's a recognition of the help and assistance provided by predominantly family members or someone who you have a very close relationship with. Um, I think the courts have clarified that girlfriends and boyfriends are included, even though they're not official family, but they can make services claims. Um, services is basically, as I say, that recognition by the courts that, yeah, your family are always going to help you out if you're unfortunate enough to be involved in a road traffic accident and you can't do things for yourself. But the courts recognize that this help and assistance family members provide goes above and beyond what would normally be expected anyway. So a financial award can be made on the basis of help and assistance provided to you by family members, but also help and assistance you have rendered. So say if you are the man of the house and you do the DIY, you do the dog walking, you do all of that, I know I certainly do in my house, then you can make a claim for this because if you've been injured and you can't do the DIY and you can't walk the dog and somebody else has had to do that, then that is recognized as part of a claim too. So it really falls into two brackets. It's services rendered and also um, services um to the, by the injured party's relative. So rendered and given effectively. The next and perhaps most important, depending on your point of view, is your motorcycle. Now, lots of my clients always, well, the first thing that comes out of their mouth after they've picked themselves up the floor, if they can, is how's my bike? Always a question very high on the list of a, um, a well-experienced motorcyclist. Now, there are two options really in a personal injury claim for dealing with your motorcycle. And it depends on how you want the matter to be resolved because at the end of the day, your case is your own and you're in the driving seat. So you can either deal with it with your insurer directly or it can be included as part of your personal injury claim if you instruct an independent solicitor. There are advantages and disadvantages to each um, option and taking good legal advice on which option is right for you is quite important. Your insurer is a route which is often used for expediency. 
Now, if you ring up your insurer following a collision and say, I've been injured and my motorcycle is in bits and it's currently being stored at so-and-so's garage, what your insurer will do is they will instruct a company who are an accident management company. The likes of Plantech or Fourth Dimension, uh, you might have heard of them, will come along and they'll take your bike out of storage, they'll transport it down to their facility, they will have it assessed, they'll provide you with the assessment or your insurer, and they'll say whether or not your bike can be repaired or written off. They might also provide you with a higher bike for the intervening period, all sorts of things they can offer you in the guise of helping you after your accident. Now, there's no huge problem with going through your insurer, especially if liability is not going to be an issue because you can have the matter dealt with quickly. Your insurer is going to quickly pay you out. Your bike will be assessed at a fast time and it won't really be a huge issue. It can be settled off. Now, the other option is that you include this part of your personal injury claim. This tends to be something which is normally done with liability is definitely not going to be an issue and an early interim payment can be sought in relation to the bike so that that can be settled and possibly repaired, replaced at an early stage. We would always instruct an independent engineer for the purposes of assessing your motorcycle. They probably come to your house if your bike isn't in storage and they will provide a report on whether or not it can be fixed or if it needs to be written off. And then that report is submitted to a third party insurer, the at fault insurer, and um, an agreement is reached in relation to payout. Now, I know the common question is, if I use my insurer, will I be penalized in the future in terms of a claim that I've made? And the answer to that is, it depends. And we'll come on to this slightly later on in the talk. If your insurer pays you out for your motorcycle and you're making a claim from a third party insurer, then your own insurer can claim that money back at a later stage. So the thing for you is you're happy because your motorcycle has been dealt with, you've been paid out for that, all tickety-boo, that's fine. But your insurer is out of pocket. So they will seek their costs back from the third party insurer. And because they've got their costs back and they haven't really incurred any, you know, they're not out of pocket as a result of the incident you were involved in, then it shouldn't really affect your insurance premium. It does vary from insurer to insurer. But that is always the argument I have made is that, well, you're not out of pocket, so therefore, why should the client be penalized for a claim that was made? Um, it really does depend on the individual circumstances as to how you would like to deal with your motorcycle. My preference would always be to um, first give you advice on it if you came to me. But I do appreciate that an insurer does move quite quickly and you might sign things which you don't read. Um, and just be wary of this. A lot of people have legal expense protection and other insurance products like this. Always my top tip would be read anything your insurer gives you if you've been involved in an accident and read it very carefully. Because sometimes you can be signing agreements which effectively loan you certain things. So, for example, a credit hire agreement where you get a motorcycle, but your insurer or the person providing it to you can claim that money back from you if they don't get it from the other side. So it's important to read anything you're ever given. Um, next, is your motorcycle kit? And particularly um, your helmet. Now, as we all know, whenever a helmet is you know, involved in an impact, it should be replaced. Some of us, unfortunately, have even seen our helmets fall off of our bikes as we've uh, perched them on the handlebar. And we might be in a situation where we have to replace it because of that. Your head is the most important thing you have. And we all tend to afford, well, try and buy the best kit we possibly can. And with a motorcycle helmet specifically, it's always replaced in full. It should certainly be always replaced in full. If you're ever in a situation where you're being advised that you should take a deduction in relation to your helmet, I would be very, very skeptical as to why that advice is being given. Because your helmet is a safety item and safety items need to be replaced in full. You can't be offered, say you're, you've got a Shoei or an RI helmet and it costs you 500 quid. You can't then be told by an insurer, well, there's this perfectly good helmet for 50 pounds that we saw in Aldi. It's just not appropriate and it's not on. And I have had cases where I've litigated, I've raised a court action because we couldn't reach agreement on a helmet. I've got one at the moment where 
my per client, he had a, a helmet that cost him £450. And he was involved in a, it was not a terribly serious accident, but it was one whereby his helmet required to be replaced because it was similar to the one that you can see there on the photo, but there was a huge scrape over the top of it. And even though he recovered from his physical injuries quite quickly and he was able to get back on the bike, he couldn't afford to replace the helmet on a like-for-like -like basis. So in order to mitigate his loss and keep on riding his bike, which was his only form of transport, he bought one for 50 quid. It was the most he could afford at the time. But at the end of the day, the helmet that had been damaged was 450 pounds. So we intimated all of this information to the third party insurer, but they refused to replace the helmet on a like for like basis and said, well, he bought one for 50 quid. We'll give you 50 quid. And it's just not on particularly with this client who's trying to mitigate his loss, he's trying to do his utmost to make sure that his loss doesn't carry on because his motorcycles is only a form of transport and he could have a loss of use claim. So I have had situations in the past where we have litigated over, you know, not being given full cost for a helmet. Other gear, um, depending on its nature, is also sometimes replaced on a like-for-like -like basis. But the thing to remember as well is that items which aren't, protective items do tend to um, be up for a reduction for ordinary wear and tear. So if you have a favorite pair of leathers you've been rolling around for 20 years in, you're unlikely to get settlement for a brand new pair of leathers. And this would be the same whether it's an insurer assessing it or whether it's a sheriff. A sheriff will not give you an award for a brand new pair of leathers if your leathers are well worn and they're 20 years old because they're not worth the same amount. So that's known as betterment. You are only allowed to be um, compensated for what you had to begin with. And sometimes it's quite hard to actually put a figure on that because there can be sentimental value attached to various items and other things like this. But ultimately it comes down to what's fair and just and reasonable. And if it's a safety item, ordinarily it's replaced in full. We see more and more of these um, things like airbag vests and other things. That these new safety items which um, are being incorporated, more people are buying. Those, of course, um, are new technologies, but I have had cases in the past where we've successfully claimed for the full value of an airbag jacket. So it does depend on whether or not it's protective or not, but it's always about getting that across to the insurer, who I can guarantee you has never seen a motorcycle in their life. A subrogated claims. It's the next one, please, Rod. Thank you. Uh, we have a lovely picture of a piggyback being given. At least it looks like a piggyback, I think. Um, now, a subrogated claim follows on from uh, that slide regarding your motorcycle. What is a subrogated claim? Well, a subrogated claim is effectively a claim your insurer can make, and it piggybacks onto your own personal injury claim. So, Say, for example, you have a personal injury claim ongoing with Motorcycle Law Scotland, but for expediency, you did not include your motorcycle as part of the claim, and you decided to claim for that through your own insurer. What your insurer can do is they can seek to recover the cost of paying you out for your motorcycle as part of a subrogated claim. So it piggybacks onto your own claim. And then we include the whole of the claim um, against the third party insurer. So we say your, you know, your own insurer has paid you out for the motorcycle. We include that as part of the claim against the at fault insurer. So basically it's a transfer of the right of claim. Um, they're able to have the same right you would uh, to claim against the at fault individual. So that's what subrogated claims are and how they operate. The long and short of it is, if an insurer is able to recover their full outlay, you should not be disadvantaged in any way in relation to any no claims bonuses or any increase in insurance premiums. Um, insurers are quite tricky beasts, but if you know how to navigate um, them correctly, then it's always good to keep these things in mind. And of course, if you ever have any questions in relation to insurance matters, we do offer a free legal advice service, which I will come on to in due course. Um, I'm not an expert in insurance by all means, but I do deal with them day in, day out. So I can perhaps provide a few tips if you want. Next slide, please, Rod. Now, everybody is an individual, as I have stressed throughout this presentation. You are different from the next person. And 
each case is fact sensitive. A lot of the time, what a case will come down to is the individual circumstances. We don't treat clients as numbers. Um, you're not on a roll of hundreds of cases that we buy in from your insurer. If you've come to us, you've heard of us and you know what we do and you know that we're independent and you know that we will put you at the forefront of any action. The thing to remember always is that your case is your own. It's your case. And whilst I or any of my colleagues at Motorcycle Law Scotland can give you advice on your case, you can choose whether or not you wish to accept or reject that advice. You are ultimately in control of everything from step one. I take my instructions from you as the client, and I am literally just an agent to put across your point of view. So you are an individual, and that is why we, you know, that's our raison d'etre, treat everybody as an individual that they are. But what if it happens to you? Uh, what if the worst happens and you're involved in a motorcycle incident? Well, the best thing to do, if you can, is to take photographs. If you're able to, um, if you're a compass mentis after um, and you're able to walk around, get as many photographs as you can. Most important thing is that third party registration number. So the vehicle that's possibly caused the incident, get their registration number if you can. A lot of the time, if you've been knocked off a motorcycle, you might not be able to take photos because unfortunately you'll be either in the back of an ambulance or on the floor being tended to. In those situations, the police come in and they come in very handy because after the preservation of life, their role is to ingather information. So what the police will do is they will attend and they will take relevant information from everybody there and then your solicitor can access that at a later stage. Um, but if you can and if you're able to, photographs at the scene are always very helpful. Now, as I've mentioned, we offer a free legal advice service. So if you ever do have any questions, I hope there'll be a few at the end of this um, webinar. I think there are, I've seen them coming in. But if you do have any questions, we do offer this free legal advice service. Um, it says it's a half hour free consultation, but if you call me up, then I'll quite happily have a chat to you for however long. Um, at the end of the day, we're here to help. You know, we're motorcyclists just like you. You might not have a case, you might just have a query. Please do call up. Um, happy to help the motorcycle community. That's what we're here for and that's what we provide. It's a service we provide. Now, I think that's me. Um, sorry for rambling on a little bit. Um, it's not the most interesting thing, but it might hopefully have given you a bit of an insight into how claims are valued and how they're made up. Um, I wasn't able to insert as many jokes as I normally do, so apologies for that. But I think there are a few questions that have come in, Rod, so I'll be happy to answer those now. There are, and there's some more coming in as well. So first of all, thank you, Thomas, <laughs> for a really interesting and in-depth presentation. I, I'm sure that uh, was very, will be very, very well received by everybody who listened to it, including myself. Um, yeah, no, we've had a few questions. David's asked a question in relation, I think we've perhaps answered it before, but maybe not to this audience, in relation to criminal cases and civil cases. So if someone's found guilty in a criminal case, and I know we've had this, does it, the conviction affect or sway the potential civil case in any way? A very good question. Um, the answer is it kind of depends. Um, whilst the criminal law and the civil law are separate, so even though they are separate, they do kind of inform each other. Just because you've been convicted of, say you were convicted of careless driving on your motorcycle, but you were still injured, it doesn't preclude you from pursuing your personal injury claim. Um, if a conviction has been made against you, it can sometimes be a little difficult because the evidence that has led to that conviction might have an effect on your civil claim and who's at fault there. We have had cases in the past where we have had for careless or dangerous driving, but we've still been able to be successful in securing compensation for them. And a lot of the times these are cases where you have quite a serious injury, but there is an element of speed or, or careless riding involved, and they're very high value cases. So you might be successful still proving negligence on the part of the at fault person, but there might be a degree of what's known as contributory negligence against you to represent the, you know, the danger and you know, failures you brought to a particular incident. So it doesn't necessarily preclude a claim from proceeding, but 
any evidence that leads to conviction can obviously, obviously um, have an impact on the civil claim too. Thank you. Okay, uh, David, uh, another question actually, uh, uh, who, he's related, a question in relation to the old Smidzy. So you have an incident, the car driver says, oh, sorry mate, didn't see you. How much use is this as evidence? Does it help someone else in regard to their claim? Um, ability, not, not really. Um, anything said at the instant scene uh, isn't hard evidence, really, because, I mean, whilst, say, for example, we are in court, that might be your evidence as a client is this driver said to me, sorry, mate, I didn't see you at the instant scene. And if we are in court, it'll be for a sheriff to decide whether or not that evidence is reliable. So he might accept you as a reliable witness and accept that that is what was said at the instant scene if a story has changed later on. But ultimately, it comes down to the hard, independent evidence. So what you're looking at is the features of the road, how the incident occurred, any expert evidence that might be required, any damage to the vehicles. Witness testimony is difficult evidence because you can be guaranteed that if 10 people see the same incident, there'll be 10 different views on who's at fault and why people are at fault. So whilst witness evidence can sometimes be helpful, and what third parties say can sometimes be helpful. Ultimately, what you're looking at is everything in the round and the hard evidence as to how the accident occurred is more helpful really for a case. Okay, cool. Um, Ewan, I just want you to explain the difference between the protocol of 12 weeks to discuss liability or to agree liability of the insurer and the actual time limit that you have to actually intimate a claim. Ah. So if a claim has been intimated, that's it off and running. Um, and there's obviously that 12 weeks for the insurer to actually note interest and come to a decision. But there is in Scotland a three-year period by which a claim must either be raised in court or settled. So from the time the accident occurs, you have three years and the time starts ticking as soon as the accident has occurred. So if you don't know what to do and you wait around for two and a half years, then it can be a little bit difficult, but ultimately you have a three-year window. After the three years has been extinguished and you haven't raised an action in court or your case hasn't been settled, then you lose your right to claim. And it's known as time bar. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, final question I think we have here from Niall in relation to, I guess, a breadwinner. So if someone's involved in an incident and they are a working provider providing for their family. How does their position differ to someone who's perhaps retired in terms of the interruption of ability to provide for their family? How do the courts view that and the insurance companies view that difference? So, so it would probably be covered under both the wage loss element and the services element. Um, if you're the main breadwinner, then obviously there's going to be an impact to your wage loss, which you, you'll see. And if you're the employee, you'll see the loss. But also, it will also be covered by the services aspect because, you know, your partner may have to get an additional job or you might have to apply for benefits, all sorts of different things. Um, whereas if you have a retired individual, there's not going to be any wage loss because they're not working. But it would be covered under both services and wage loss element of the claim if you're the main breadwinner. Excellent. Brilliant. All right. Uh, I think that's all the questions we've had. Um, that just leaves me to thank, of course, you, Thomas, uh, for another really interesting presentation Good and uh, to welcome you hopefully again next week, if you're not too busy, to talk to us about, you, and you intimated or talked about a little bit about it tonight as well, but looking at insurance and the panel solicitors, the credit hires, the middlemen that operate around insurers and trying to get your bike back. Uh, credit hire, storage charges, that murky area where people struggle uh, trying to get insurance renewals. Why does it affect my premium? Why has it gone up? All of those good things. So uh, hopefully you can perhaps provide some information and knowledge to us all next week regarding that. Yes, that'll be a good one, I think. So if, if, if you are going to stick around for that one, please do. Please tell your friends about it because I think it might be quite a popular one and we can hopefully dispel some of the myths and shine some light on these murky areas that exist in the insurance industry.
<laughs> All right, lots of positive comments coming in, and thanks for you, Thomas, and your uh, the excellence of your presentation. So it's nice to see that. Thanks very much to everybody for joining us on this lovely sunny Thursday evening. We wish you well for tomorrow and the weekend and enjoy getting out on your bike and hopefully we'll see you all next week.